G'day everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Stokes. I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons and I'm very excited to welcome you all to today's webinar on infrastructure and DMPs or data management plans. This is a combined event with the um, data management plans interest group that I coordinate locally around Australia and the Research Data Alliance. Um, we're running this in collaboration with their regional virtual event. I'm very excited to present an awesome lineup of speakers today. And to start, I would like to um, make sure I can work the controls on this um, key, uh, on this slide deck. So to start with, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I'm standing. For me, that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm based in Sydney, Australia. Um, I acknowledge and pay respect to the elders past and present and um, note that Indigenous sovereignty has not been ceded yet in this country. Um, I would like to invite you, if you are familiar with the traditional custodians of the land where you are, to um, say hello and acknowledge that in the chat um, section on um, in this WebEx platform. Uh, as a way of introducing yourselves to each other. Because um, that's a nice thing. So in order to um, crack on and get started, I'm going to invite my colleague, Stephanie Kethers, who is also uh, the Director of Operations at the Research Data Alliance, to say a few words about the RDA Virtual Plenary and um, the reason for this webinar today. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, my name is Stefanie Kitas. I'm the Director of Operations of the Research Data Alliance, as Liz just said. And as you may know, the Research Data Alliance, or RDA, is an international initiative that was launched as a community-driven um, initiative in March 2013. And RDA members come together at working in interest groups to build the social and technical bridges to enable open sharing and reuse of data. RDA usually convenes two plenaries a year, which are being held in different locations around the world, which is now happening virtually, which of course makes time zones a bit of an issue. The most recent plenary was held in April in Edinburgh, and um, it was very difficult to follow the whole plenary and still get some sleep, I have to say. So, the uh, this next slide, please. So the idea of the RDA regional virtual event is basically my breakfast to bring back some of the topics from the RDA plenary and discuss them in the regional context. So today's session on infrastructure and data management plans is one of them. And apart from this session, we already we also have an RDA Q&A and catch up session tomorrow at 3 p.m. AEST. And we also have on Thursday a session on data policies, which is going to be run by my colleague Natasha Simons. Um, and that's going to be held at 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. AEST on Thursday. And if you would like more information or to register for any of the upcoming sessions, you'd be very welcome to visit the URL that's just there. And we will, I can put that into chat as well, just in case. Thanks very much. And that's it from me. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so I would now like to um, welcome our uh, wonderful panel of presenters today. So I, I chose this picture because it looked like um, it included things like landscape and paths and things that look like infrastructure and also things that look a little bit like a BMX bike track. Um, and I think that that's a rich visual metaphor for the um, the creativity, ingenuity, and um, let's say heart that people um, that I I know in this sector bring to developing infrastructure for data management plans. So today I would like to um, I'm going to welcome Peter Nish. Uh, from the University of Melbourne, who is going to give us an update on the um, plan on the um, maintenance and adoption of um, what the DMP Common Standards Working Group have been um, developing for machine actionable DMPs. I'm also going to um, welcome Roland Mossbergen from the Walter and Elizabeth Hall Institute 
who, uh, as a vociferous member of our DMP interest group here in Australia, has got some interesting questions and um, experience to share um, when developing data management plans for researchers. We're also, now you would have um, seen that Maria Pritzelis um, was the assigned speaker from um, DMP tool today. Unfortunately, she can't make it today. So we have her esteemed colleague, John Shidaki here, who's gonna to talk to us about DMP tools and PIDS infrastructure. Um, after that, we have Andrew Brasati from uh, Australia's own QCIF, the Queensland Cyber Infrastructure Fund or Foundation. Um, who is going to talk to us about service provisioning and um, do a quick demo of um, Redbox. And then um, finally, um, last but not least, we have Peter Sefton, um, who's a visiting consultant, from, independent consultant from um, the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, who is going to talk about what do we really want from data management plans. So um, I'm gonna run all of these presentations together. They all have five minutes. So I'm just making sure everybody knows that so that we have the, an internal clock as well as a social clock here. Um, I'll share that responsibility with you all. Please um, offer your questions and comments in the chat as we go through and we will, um, we will run a Q&A session after everyone, after all our panelists have finished speaking. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to um, Peter Nish, and I look forward to um, what you have to share with us today. Okay, thanks Liz. Um, I can share my screen, we'll give that a go. So are people seeing that? So, yep, good. Um, so, yes, I'm a co-chair of the um, DMP Common Standards Working Group, along with Thomas Mixer and Paul Walk. And just a super, super quick introduction to machine actionable DMPs, or MA DMPs for short. Um, they're, they're an idea that came about to try and take um, a standard DMP, which was just kind of blobs of text that researchers would submit to funders to fulfil you know, an obligation. Um, to something that's actually useful, that was machine actionable, that that could um, be used to trigger actions, could be validated, could um, actually have information that could be computed on. So to fully implement um, MADMPs, um, we needed three things. We needed like a well-defined um, RDM workflows. We needed you know infrastructure to do this, repositories, DMP kind of systems and also a common standard to represent information. And there's a link there to the standard, which we've been developing up for the last couple of years. So it's now version 1.1, and it's, it's being used uh, um, by a number of adopters. And I'll just go through quickly um, what, we've, what we've discovered so far. So I'll focus just on the infrastructure side of things. Um, there, there are other sort of other things that we're sort of other people focus on with, with DMPs, but in terms of um, MA DMPs, we like to think of it as like glue between different systems and a way to get information in and out of those systems. So during the RDA, RDA um, plenary, we had um, you know quite a number of stories of adoptions. People have been using it. Um, we'll hear from John about DMP tool, which is great. Um, um, Maria Pretzelis talked about Fair Island. Um, we've got, yeah, we've got DMP tools. We've got a publisher. We've got um, a repository, like Haplo repository, um, a number of other DMP tools. Um, we have Crossref, you know, um, in, implementing kind of our standard within um, a data type there. So um, there's there's quite a lot of people um, showing interest and and using the the system. So the thing we're discovering is, you know, we've, um, we obviously, um, this is a, a lot of consultation. We had the, the tools developers on board, um, but things aren't perfect. So, you know, a large part of the RDA was, was looking at, okay, what are the issues? What do we need to fix? Where can we improve it? So these are kind of the three top open issues, but um, I'll, I'll point you, I'll put a link in the chat to our GitHub where all these things discuss. So 
Um, if you're interested, that's where all the information is around the, the common standard. But the things that we're kind of tackling, like um, how we create an extension, people can, um, um, like specific information that's not as, not as general, just specific use cases. Um, so how to actually do that within the standard. Um, also identifiers, you know, there was some assumptions made around data sets having a single identifier because of a standard that we we're implementing for our standard. Um, and that's so that that may need a little bit of a change. And also some of the things, how to make things um, more explicit when they're planned or when actions have actually taken place or have not taken place. So currently it's using dates, but that's um, a bit fragile and um, um, needs some tightening up. So that, that's kind of three of the major things we're looking at. There's a few, quite a few little minor things as well. Um, the other main thing we're doing, um, again, we ran a hackathon last year, which had um, nearly a hundred people in a number of different teams. And one of those teams looked at funder templates and whether the common standard could effectively transfer that information around um, between systems. So um, we looked at so some European, some US templates. Uh, I'm keen if anyone can tell, point me to other templates that, that funders might use, uh, especially in the Australian context, I'd be really interested. Um, and from that, we've discovered that, yeah, that there's, there's some things we may need to extend the standard, put some more information in. Um, we may need a funder extension so that we can, we can more easily reuse those things. And, um, or it might just mean a slight um, change to the description of the standard. So, so that's kind of the area where we're working at the moment. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there and uh, answer questions uh, after, after the talks if necessary. Yeah. Thanks so much, Peter. That's no excellent. Okay, uh, next in our um, illustrious line, we have Roland uh, Mossbergen. Um, did you want to share your screen, Roland? Yes, I would. Hi, uh, my name is Roland. I'll be looking slightly askance at my screen, my second screen. And these are some personal thoughts on infrastructure relying on DMP. Um, one of the things that I think is uh, really important is wh wh whatever you call them, whether it's IDM life cycles or whatever, being able to actually understand what the actual workflow looks like for researchers is really important. And this is a very poorly uh, documented version of what I've got so far. And I think it'd be quite cool to be able to uh, expand on this because I think uh, as, a, as someone who sort of sits between both the research and the research infrastructure, having this sort of information allows me to interact with the researchers better, help them understand things a little bit better. But anyway, um, um, but I think the the thing that I tend to see is this difference between the minimum compliance over the maximum benefit. And I guess minimum compliance really, you could read all that or you could just say, hey, minimum compliance is just getting paperwork and giving it to the researchers and then being done with it. And the maximum benefit is actually how do we uh, provide a competitive advantage for our research by tying things together and making it easy. And while this increases the complexity of the ultimate benefit is that is the uptake from the researchers. And I think that's the real key. How do researchers really use this in a way that's going to be able to help them uh, in the future? And I also started realizing that there's a clash of cultures because uh, with DMPs, it's more like a waterfall. Okay, what are you going to do? And I think the the challenge I gave to people in the in the DMP group was, okay, can you write out all your projects for the next three years and document how many files you're going to use and how much space you're going to use? Because that's what you're asking the researchers to do. And, and they work in an agile way. So how do we go away from saying this waterfall versus an agile approach, which is just in time to make informed decisions? And how can we gather that information in a way that they can be reused in the future, I guess? So I think from the last meeting, some of the questions were that we had at the DMP was, metrics and adoption on DMPs and how effective they are from a researcher's perspective. 
and linking DMPs to other systems and making them useful, not just for the researchers, but maybe for the grants department or from the legal department or, or whatever. So uh, one of my favorite slides, thank you, Peter. Uh, I use this quite a lot. Um, and it's just showing we need to think of uh, ecosystems instead of data silos. And uh, the, the DMP or whatever goes for a DMP can, can uh, sort of connect there. I've tried to do this at a lower level um, and this is an older version, but the idea is to map out the original life cycle, which is my second slide, with that ecosystem and start to say, well, you know, how does that ecosystem connect with the researcher? One, two, three, four, five. The slides will be there, so you can have a look. But it's just an idea of being able to map those over there. And sometimes we find that we've got a big gap when it comes to things like visualizing data or having interactive data sets online. And I really like these uh, um, slides uh, from, I think it was uh, uh, Simon of Lassa, uh, because, but the, I guess the question is asking about what information is actually needed versus information that is guesswork. And can we do that just in time? So uh, I think there's this one here that says, okay, I'm gonna have raw data that's 4.3 megabytes, uh, you know, and it's, it's really, really difficult to guess that. But is there a way of being able to find a different way of being able to do that and maybe increase storage dynamically and provide running totals instead of things? And I think this is a really great way of being able to look at it and get researchers to interact. And I also started to think about what are the key questions that researchers actually want answered when it comes to research data management? And therefore, maybe through the data management plans that you might be able to ask them at the start of the project as part of their experimental design. So, you know, where is the data that my postdoc generated four years ago? This is a very medical research type of thing. So some people don't have postdocs. Um, is the sensitive data I'm bringing to the organization being looked after? Electronic lab notebooks. You know, if, I'm, if I have the electronic notebook, can I find where the data is? Or if I can find where the data is, can I find where my electronic notebook is? But it's also for people who actually generate data as well. And, but you've also got governance, legal, and of course, IT services. So by actually taking those into account and trying to narrow down the focus, my, I guess my question is, what parts of the DMP are really valuable for people to go through? And that's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Roland. Um, those are such interesting questions. And I can see in the chat um, that those that your diagrams have resonated um, with people there. So moving swiftly along, I'm going to um, pass over to John Shidaki um, from um, the California Digital Library uh, at the University of California, who is going to talk to us about the networked DMPs and the Fair Island project. Thank you. Um, yeah, I apologize. Uh, my colleague Maria Pretzels wasn't able to join today. Um, so I'm here filling in and these slides are somewhat new to me. So hopefully um, it goes smoothly. But yes, I'm here to talk about network DMPs, uh, machine actionable DMPs and the Fair Island project. Um, for for those that um, are were here last time, you'll maybe have uh, heard of the Fair Island project in the past. Um, and I'll just quickly go over some of our aims. So just as some people have mentioned already so far, um, you know, a lot of the infrastructure for maintaining and creating machine actual DMPs is in the works. It's being discussed, it's being implemented. Um, the team that Marie and I work on at, worked with at CDL um, run the DMP tool and we have been embracing um, a lot of that infrastructure and the, and the common standards to support that work going forward. Um, Separate from all of that, and maybe in conjunction and informed by all of that, we've also been looking at some of the questions that we just heard around, you know, what makes uh, DMPs interesting to researchers and how do we judge whether or not they're actually successful long term, which brings this question of saying, what are optimal data policies, the policies that inform the data management plan requirements that then have researchers creating data management plans what are the optimal policies themselves? And what are the technical infrastructures that would uh, incentivize better usage of DMP technologies and also updating technology, uh, those DMPs over time? 
And so we are embarking on a project called Fair Island, where we're working directly with field station run by the university field stations run by the University of California. Um, and we're partnering with two field stations that UC runs in the South Pacific um, in French Polynesia. And we're working with them on revamping their data policies that they they administer locally for anybody who visits the islands for field stations um, to to optimize it so that we can then also um, over time track the effectiveness of of uh, compliance with those policies. And so using the DMP really as the anchor and machine actionable DMPs as a way of transmitting that information over time and iterating with uh, with the researchers over time. And so Fair Island is a research project in itself. Um, we will be iterating the data policy. We will be iterating on the data management plans that we are asking people to fill out. And we are integrating it into our existing infrastructure. So we're integrating it into DMP tool. We're integrating these um, changes and exchange of information into the reservation systems that the researchers have to use when they book time at the field stations. And we're really using this as an opportunity to track over time, over years, um, how researchers interact um, differently based on the different policies. And as was mentioned before, we do run a international uh, group uh, or, uh, tool called DMP tool. It is a platform for creating DMPs. It includes guidance um, we've for, for the different requirements from different funders. Um, we have partners around the world and we co-develop with DMP online, a code base that's leveraged by multiple um, different partners globally. And we're really focusing on trying to build a machine actionable future for this platform. And so the common standards work that Peter mentioned earlier is something that we've already incorporated into the way that we manage the information and exchange information within that tool. And so machine actionable DMPs and the workflows that are are embedded in the, the kind of the terminology that we're talking about um, today, that's really our way of saying, you know, we're trying to network the information that's inside of the DMP. And Fair Island is really an example of how we want to try to test some of that out. What is the value of that networking? Um, and just real quick, some, some updates from the project. Um, one aspect of the project is to basically pitify all the different pieces of information that's inside of a DMP. Um, and we have started working with Datasite on using the DMP itself as a container and assigning uh, DMP IDs to the DMP. And the reason to do this is um, to create a space where we can claim um, what is happening around research. And so what you see here is uh, the purple dot in the middle is actually the PID assigned to the DMP itself. And all of the outputs of the, that are they're coming out of and all the information that's associated from that DMP is then traceable over time. And in this example, we actually retrofitted this, this idea on a past project. So you could really see that this DMP was working with or uh, researchers at one or, uh, university that had multiple funders and multiple publications and multiple data sets. And you could, over time, if you put it as linearly, you would be able to see it grow over time based on what was being um, stated in the DMP. Um, and we've also started working on this within the DMP tool itself. So here's a, a, a representation from a, a landing page of exactly that information that um, the DMP ID now would resolves to this this landing page that as you can see would include information about the project start and end date um, information that we know can be made public um, but also as the data sets and articles grow from that research it's something that the, the landing page itself would start to grow and so this is really just trying to work with different identifiers um, and assigning those and mapping those into what we're tracking as part of the machine actionable dmp so this is um, work that's uh, been built into the DMP tool um, to track different aspects of the work that researchers do, but it's also something that we are talking about leveraging when we move further down into uh, the Fair Island project. Um, the latest version of DMP tool 3.0 does have a way of inputting research outputs in, uh, directly into the system, tracking those individually, um, ID minting, the DMP ID minting, and the DMP ID landing page. Um, and obviously, what we work on is a global uh, partnership across many different levels. So, just want to 
thank everybody, including RDA and the folks here who have been very helpful with um, keeping everything moving. Um, so if you have any questions, Maria is the product manager for DMP tool. Um, also, I'll be here to ask answer questions um, later on in the hour. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, John, for that. Um, it's so wonderful to see a lot of this um, this infrastructure being um, being so becoming quite familiar and being able to see lots of synchronicity to the attention towards um, developing the infrastructure and the plumbing. So our um, next speaker is um, uh, is Peter Sefton. Yes, I got that right. Sorry, my um, no, sorry. It's I'm, Andrew. Andrew. It's Andrew Brazzetti. Okay, well, I'll have to remember to delete my blunder from the recording. Sorry about that, Andrew. Okay. Um, so Andrew from QCIF is going to talk about uh, Redbox and um, provision and how that particular local product provisions um, services services um, for researchers. Take it away, Andrew. No worries. Cool. So. Um... Yes, yeah, so I'll start quickly. If you haven't heard of uh, Redbox, um, it's a research data management platform um, that assists researchers um, with their planning, um, creation, and publishing of their research data sets. Um, yeah, it's an open source product uh, managed by the software solutions team at, at QCIF. Um, and yeah, it's highly customizable um, and has a lot of integration um, with a number of different systems. And um, I'll be talking about a little bit about service provisioning today. Um, and one of the big strengths of the product is it's quite clearly driven so many of the different by our users on, on that. Um, yeah, this is a bit, bit of a quick diagram about how Redbox interacts with things. So, um, you know, typically a researcher will create an, an RDMP, um, and from there they can um, actually provisioning of, of storage um, and create um, a, at the other end collection um, metadata about those uh, the data that's been created from that project. And, and Redbox manages linkages between all those things. Um, and the next slide is a, a diagram that you might have already seen today. So thanks, Peter, again for making this back in the day. Um, but yeah, this is essentially how Redbox, um, the provisioning framework, works. It um, um, allows you to uh, plug in a number of different adapters um, that uh, know how to provision um, services in a variety of different systems. Um, and yeah, the, the list is, is growing all the time as we as we work with our with our users. So I want to quickly show you um, the Redbox form and how how that um, how uh, this all um, works. So if I switch over to this one here, so we've got a research data management plan here that um, we've we figured up. Um, I won't fill out the whole form for everyone, um, but um, so, so there's a number of different forms uh, fields within the form that you can um, configure to your your, your needs. Um, and yeah, we've got a tab at the end for workspaces, which is what we call um, services within Redbox, um, and you can see there's a, a a link for one I've created earlier um, here that describes a workspace that's been created for this particular uh, research data management plan, and including some location information as well based on that. So typically, a researcher will um, come into the uh, form and pick from a list that have been configured. Uh, in this uh, demo environment, we've got a very basic um, example, which is a, a CentOS 7 Linux virtual machine um, that's provisioned in, in Google Cloud. Um, the particular plugin um, that we're using here uses a, a, a library called Terraform that supports a number of different um, cloud services, so it's it's highly extensible. Um, probably a more typical use case here would be a it would provision a virtual machine that has a bunch of research tools already pre-installed on it, so the researcher can go in and. And, and and start using it. Um, so yeah, once they've selected um, a workspace, they can click on the open button, and it will take them to a form that will has more specific information about the um, the service in question. Um, because there is a linkage will be created to the RDMP. It could also pre-fill some values as well in here if they if they're, if they're useful. Um, so, uh, but this one here is just a very simple one, so it doesn't have any of that. So I'll just quickly pull out. This is a bit of a magic number 
uh, in here, but in a, in a real world form, you, you can make it generate a key, key for the user to log in or, or pick from a list that they might already have. Um, but yes, it's just a very basic example. So if I click on create workspace on that, you'll see that a new linkage is being created for this new VM. Um, obviously, it takes a little bit of time um, to spin up a VM, a couple, a couple of minutes, but that's probably more minutes than we than we have for this particular um, demonstration. Um, but eventually, once it's complete, we'll get a, a linkage there as well. So within the plan, we've got a link to the workspace that's been created. But also there's a reverse linkage. So if I go into the new workspaces area, you'll see a bunch of VMs that I've uh, created in the past for, for demonstrations, um, their locations and um, where what plan they're, they're linked to. So um, yeah, we've got a, a two-way linkage there as well. Um, and this is also where you go and view a RDMP that you've created, the summary page also outlines those particular ones. And you can see that that one I've created before actually did complete in time. So there it is there. So that's my, um, what I've got for this presentation. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, that's wonderful. Um, whenever I see people, watch people demonstrating um, a, a tool, um, I always think about maybe one day in the future we can have a tool demo like Olympics or something and see who can create the fastest DMP under pressure um, and, you know, how you know, compare researchers against um, repository managers and dev teams. Um, but maybe that's um, an, a dream. Sure. My, my typing falls apart under pressure, so <laughs> the less typing I do, the better. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thank you for that. And um, now I will introduce Peter Sefton, who is going to round out our presenter panel today. Uh, Peter, would you like me to um, be screen host for you or would you like to share screen? Ah, you've got it already. Great. Okay, your time starts now. Peter, I think you're muted. I'm sorry, Peter, I don't think we can hear you just yet, um, unless this is um, maybe this is a um, useful way of understanding of what happens when the very important data stream right. um, disappears. That, can you hear me now? Yes. Right. So this is this is roughly where I live and this, the, uh, which is uh, Darragan Gundagara people's land. Um, Liz asked me to talk about what we can expect from infrastructure to support DMPs. And as usual, I might have a few positive things to say about progress we've made, but probably spend a little bit of time talking about what we need and where the gaps still are. Um, the, what we really want from DMPs is that they're useful to people. Um, and so broadly, people might find a DMP useful in, a, like in two very broad ways without talking about carrots and sticks. It may be that you have to do one or engage with this process to get money or continue to get money or um, you know, satisfy requirements from somebody, um, or it might be that it can do useful things for you. Uh, and the thing we identified at UTS was uh, provisioning. And I'm glad I didn't use reuse uh, Jared's um, provision diagram because we've already seen it twice. I've I've gone back um, in history to the um, ARDC, the Australian Research Data Commons Data Lifecycle Project. Um, which is actually where we got some of this inspiration from. So this was a vision, which I think is still pretty valid about um, how um, researchers might, doesn't say DMP here anywhere, I don't think, but um, the PAP portal, the provisioning portal there is essentially what Redbox is doing. Um, unfortunately, this um, this project seems to have been shelved, um, but a lot, I think a lot of the ideas and the data that was collected in this and the interviews they had with people were probably still really valid. So maybe we should try and restore some of it. Um, so speaking of data life cycles, uh, I just want to, I've been had a little bit of time to reflect lately and I've been working with um, a developer from um, Melbourne called Marco La Rosa, and we've been trying to come up with um, Critiquing some of the data management diagrams and particularly the use of the overuse of the word life cycle, but to come up with a, a kind of our own contextualizing diagram about what the research data management space looks like. 
Uh, so there are broadly, there's a couple of things here. And this was in the service of, of, of doing fair data, right? So how do you make things findable, accessible, reusable? Um, interoperable is a, a different kind of practice. Not so much about infrastructure, maybe. Um, maybe it is. Um, but on this, you see the workspaces. So they're the things that are around the outside of that circle, that semicircle diagram. Um, and what we wanted to emphasize is that if in, a, in an ideal system, workspaces would be ephemeral things where people go to work, uh, they would expect to get some storage for a certain amount of time, but they would be doing a constant deposit of data into the, the services that make things findable and accessible, uh, which is broadly speaking repositories. I mean, there's other ways you could do this. You could build your own infrastructure, but there is a there is actually a kind of established thing that does this, which is a data repository, uh, which looks after storing stuff, keeping it, and making it find it findable and accessible. Um, and I'm going to come back to the accessible bit as well, because that's uh, a bit of a right. So um, the next couple of slides are uh, just sort of reflections on um, because I've recently uh, you know, left the university in, in their redundancy program um, and I'm ramping back up to work in the space. I actually get to think about what, what's interesting to work on and um, and I thought that might be of interest to mention because I'm working, focusing my efforts into the places where I think there are still gaps. So one of those areas is in standardization. So the um, the machine actionable data management plans is a really important part of that. Um, one thing we're working on is a research object crate, which is uh, you know a community uh, project to to pull together a way of describing data sets so that they can be interchanged, um, which is a joint work between started from work between UTS and Manchester and has now gone global. Uh, but this was a much needed thing that um, we might have had data management plans and so on, but we didn't actually have a good way of actually just saying what is a data set and describing all these things about it. So that's one thing that I think we need to keep working on. Um, another encouraging thing that's going on is the um, starting in Europe, but it should spread to the rest of the world. This isn't that a great project name there, the CS3 mesh for EOSC. So that's a mesh of uh, false sharing services for the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, and I think this is important because this democratizes the ability for people to move data around and to share it. Um, a lot of the places that have actually, a lot of the disciplines that have managed to kind of get their data sharing act together are large verticals, physics, um, you know, the climate science people. Um, and this, um, which I'll finish on, is the thing that I'm currently obsessing about the most in terms of what kind of infrastructure we want. Uh, the, um, if we want to be able to do this provisioning and giving people access to services, uh, as we've heard about in a few contexts, um, we actually need to be able to put people into groups, into cohorts, uh, and that has to be able to be done cross institutionally. And to me, this is one of the really big gaps. Um, we have really successful things like at UTS, where you can have a um, an internal provisioning system, but it's really only useful for the people at that institution, and it misses out on the fact that lots of you know research is trans trans institutional and transdisciplinary. Um, and that and includes people who are not not parts of our research um, organisations. So, um, uh, this is kind of a. Um, I've been working um, on how we might, how I might present this to funders and try and get some some backing for how we put people into groups. But I think uh, John's presentation earlier uh, actually pointed the way to that a little bit. That um, there was a slide there showing you know how a cohort of people are associated with a data management plan. So maybe the data management planning tools. Um, could play a role in sort of authenticating uh, group membership so that you can provision things to people. And very importantly, so that you can give access. If a data set can't be made open, um, it may be open to people who are on the project or on related projects. And we don't have a good way to support that at the moment. So um, I'm going to look more into that. That's it. I just want to raise those couple of issues. I'll figure out how to stop sharing. Awesome. Oh, look, it wouldn't be a bad thing if we kept all of those smiling faces up on the screen for a while. Uh, okay. That was um, scary, Liz.
Thank you very much, Peter, for sharing what we really want from DMPs um, and RDMPs. Um, I'm glad that we've got similar names for the same thing. I'm going to hand over to my esteemed colleague, Catherine Unsworth, to um, coordinate our Q&A session. So I'll um, just briefly before I um, mute myself, I encourage you to put your questions into the chat uh, and, um, and, and join in. Uh, no question is too thorny or uh, naive. Thanks, Liz. Um, if you, oh, someone's added a question in the Q&A box. Christopher, are you able to just, well, actually, Christopher, do you want to unmute yourself and just ask your question straight up? Might be more useful. That'd be novel to speak. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was question for Andrew, um, given the chronology of the presentations following on from the, the work that Peter Nish spoke of. Um, is Redbox looking to do some work to make the MADMP compatible, if that's a uh, correct term? Yeah, it's definitely something we're, we're interested in, in doing. Um, I guess the, the project started before machine or actual BMPs were, were really a, a thing, but we've been following what's going on there. And, and, and I don't think it would be a lot of work to make it make it compatible, essentially. We need to mm. crosswalk fields from what we've got with now forms to to support the, you know, the, the right format. Exactly. Thanks for that. Um, uh, noticing, looking in the chat, um, if you do have a question, because I can't see everybody on the screen, at uh, the screen, could you just put a cue in um, the chat, and then I'll be able to identify who you are, and I can just um, throw to you, and you can speak to the question yourself. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Peter Sefton for explaining what RO Crate was, because there was a bit of discussion about that in the chat. Um, and I, if there is, there aren't any questions at the moment, I was just going to ask John. Um, now, you mentioned in relation to John Chidaki, you mentioned in relation to um, Roland's talk about um, where he expressed that researchers uh, are more interested in, you know, capturing things in their their DMPs than you know certain things that funders may want. And you talked about uh, looking at that yourselves in terms of, you know, looking at what re researchers do want to capture in their DMPs. And would would that then mean that you need to do a whole process with funders to get them on board with that? And have you started that process? And what's been the the reaction to that? If you have. Yeah, so I mean, funders are definitely the kind of frame framing that many of us begin with when we talk about data management plans, because funders very often are the ones requiring a DMP. And so um, the policies that are we're trying to comply against um, come from funders in many time, many aspects. But I mean, one of the things that we're trying to um, break apart with the Fair Island project is that um, at the very basic reason for a DMP is good data management planning. Um, and there are other aspects of, you know, why someone should want to plan for their research data. Uh, there's different reasons for that. Um, when it comes to a field station, for example, it may be that um, they're going to have multiple site visits. Um, it may be because there's collaboration with other physical stations somewhere else in the world. Um, there could be a lot of reasons why that's the case. Um, what we're trying to tease apart with the Fair Island project is um, if someone complies with certain aspects of, uh, of a policy, does it actually help the researcher? Does it really help the research and does it promote open sharing of information and, and, and better science? And um, many of that, many of those things have to do with the way people are managing the data. And that includes, uh, you know, and so, so we are building a data management plan that's specific for the field station and is specific for them. It's not directly related to the funder. Um, but there is definitely uh, the need to continue to connect with the funder. I mean, very often when we talk to funders within the DMP tool, um, they will say, of course, we want researchers, for example, of course, we want researchers to update their DMP. It's something that they put into their grant application. Why don't they update them all the time? It's actually a contractual obligation of the researcher. It's a contractual obligation of the institution itself as well. 
and there's this kind of um, kind of un, un, unspoken like nod that okay we understand we don't really check that compliance but it's something that is actually required and so what we're trying to get with with Fair Island is how do we start to tease out what actually good compliance would be and what are we really getting out of policies in this in between phase that we're at right now where funders do say that this is something they really care about but aren't necessarily checking so we can start to really understand what are the the motivations on the researcher side and i think it goes back to i'll stop talking but like i think it goes back to a lot of what everybody's saying which is that there has to be value and a lot of that has to do with tracking and management and helping with the feedback loop to the researcher themselves so um, a lot of what we're trying to build with uh, the, the graph that we saw is really making those connections so that it's easier for researchers to see their own outputs being tracked back to them um, and really understand their impact. Thanks, John. I think that's an absolutely fantastic approach. Um, really, honestly, I do. So um, I'm not sure why we haven't really sort of been taking that approach a little earlier than what we have. Um, now, there's a few questions here. Uh, I'll start with Steve McGecken. Can you, I think that's the first one here. Are you happy to ask your question, Steve? It's more, uh, I'm picking up on Peter Sefton's point about the groups across organisations. Um, we picked up on the same sort of issue, thinking about that with our, our cadre project. I haven't got an answer yet. Have you got an, an idea about this? Because I'm curious to see where you, where you would take this. Uh, so is that directed at me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I, Steve, I just, I was just just been writing up some stuff, sort of, not not published yet, but I actually used the ADA as an example, um, yep. of an internal. So you can do mediated data access. You can request access to something, and then within your own network, you can you can do something about providing it. But we do have a really thorny problem about how we have sort of you know cross system uh, authentication. And I was in the process of inventing this kind of group, having a group management server that could authenticate to um, the the Access Federation and the Australian Access Federation and Google and Facebook and the rest of them, which would let researchers manage their own cohort of people. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be useful for things like provisioning. But there's another step, which is to use it for data licensing. So if you have a group, you could say everyone in this group has a license to download data from from a particular project kind of mint a license and then repositories could come to that group's management system and and do the authentication dance that you know where things get referred off to other services. So if you work out your you work out who the person is, then you see if they're in the group and then you see if that group has a license to act, act to download a piece of a, a data set. Um, but just looking at the DMP tool, uh, that actually looks like that might be some of the way there. And so if that New things about people's orchids, for example, um, and could assert that these people were member of a project members of a project. They could have a license that goes with the project, and then you could do um, data deposit into an arbitrary repository, which which is not open. It's not a problem if it's open data, but a lot of data is not open. Um, so you, then you then we would start to have a mechanism where you could put a license on something with a URL that points to the DMP tool. And the DMP tool would have to grow some new features to be able to authenticate a person and then authorize them as a holder of that license. I, so, a, lot, a lot of moving parts, but we need something like that. Yeah, I, I think that sounds sort of along the same line. So maybe I'll follow up with you separately on that one, Peter, because um, yeah, those are the sorts of questions that we're raising here yeah, along the same line. So I'll, I'll get in touch and we can we can be we'd be great to talk that through. Right, and I'm, I'm going to be involved in the Language Data Commons project as well, yep. where we be, we'll re-implement some stuff that was done in Alveo, I hope, um, yep. that uh, will help with that. Yeah, excellent. Can right, I just, we'll uh, problems later. We'll say Peter and I have to say, we'll just have our own conversation. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, um, I mean, the common standards is something that's been, is very foundational to a lot of our work. I mean, we many people in this space Kind of came together years ago and said this is something that we need to be able to tackle these common issues and it is something that is guiding the development of the dmp tool and many of the dmp related tools out there um that the the capturing of licensing uh, on a data set by data set basis and the authentication against orchid and these types of features are all things that 
are informed by that common standards and the, the kind of round tripping of, you know, they inform the, that as well. Um, I just want to say that uh, as you're talking about these things, it's be great to feed the the new requirements uh, to the to the working group because this is the common standards is something that we're all basing our work off of. So the more people that feed feedback to them, the better. Yeah, good point. Um, evidently, I missed a question in there from Peter, um, P E T A. So um, I feel like the process, infrastructure and policy are complex chicken and egg situation. Where did you start to make effective progress? And I feel it must be for everyone on the panel. That question. Yeah, I actually wanted to add a couple um, of extra bits to that as well. Uh, systems and funding is also in that chicken egg spider web uh, type scenario. Anyone want to tackle that one? Yeah, I, I can I can give it a go. Thanks, Roland. Uh, the the big one. Hang on, let me just get up here. The big one I think is um, you need to you need to gather your leverage is the way I would explain it. So I'd probably be the way I'm trying to tackle it at the couple of institutions I've been in is to find every source of leverage from any of those particular areas and use them to actually start to bring people together to have those conversations and to use it to be able to look at something that's systematic, that's gonna be, be able to benefit everyone. And that can that can be a challenge and it takes a long time, but if you don't, so just recently I've tried to focus on the infrastructure side and I've realized I've left myself open because I haven't been uh, spreading my, uh, uh, I've been putting all my eggs in one basket, so to speak. And so I think I need to be able to make sure I, um, spread that risk out so that if I can't do something with a carrot through infrastructure, I might need to do use it as a stick through policy or use it as a carrot through somewhere else. So it's always about just having as many tools as you can to be able to get things moving into a, into a good direction. I don't know if that helps or not. Thanks Roland. Um, actually, you may as well stay on because yours was the next question. So. Uh, was that the one around? Yeah, um, yeah for Peter, for Peter Nash and the MADMPs. Are you still there, Peter? Yeah, I'm here. It's really about interoperability between systems, right? To be able to take it from one system to another, as opposed to asking people to re-implement that schema. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, really, it's more correctly called a, a metadata application profile rather than a standard, but people kind of like the word standard and we couldn't really get rid of it. But um, it, it, it is just a way of, yeah, being able to transfer that information. And I think as, um, yeah, as um, Andrew said in the comments, you know, it's really just taking that output and being able to transfer that information into another system. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're getting very close to time. Liz, are we needing to wrap up questions at this point? I think that's probably a very sensible decision as much as I really want to get into the questions that people have raised here. So I would like to, um, I've just popped in a little um, spruker for our local DMP interest group um, for people to fill out this form. You'll be added to a mailing list which sends you meeting invitations. Our next catch up is on the 17th of June and it quite possibly could be that we might have a PID swap over session um, uh, at our next group. Thank you very much, Christopher McAvaney, for volunteering to lead that. I'll be in touch shortly. Uh, anyone else um, who is here who is interested, please contact uh, me if you would like to um, uh, be involved in that. I would like to publicly acknowledge that we kind of did have a bit of a manual today. Um, so I would like to really encourage a bit of more diversity across our um, presenters um, in our next event. And I'm, um, uh, well, look, it's all of our responsibility. So um, thank you everyone for being here today. And I um, look forward to seeing you at our next group. Um, just to give you a heads up, um, the next um, RDA um, uh, information, sorry, the next RDA sessions, uh, I'll just share the screen very briefly uh, here. So we've got some sessions tomorrow and Thursday, and there are some links there. Everybody here today will receive a copy of these slides and a copy of the recording to pass on to your mates. So 
Thanks once again to our wonderful presenters today and um, my awesome ARDC colleagues uh, for their support and of course all of you in the audience and your excellent questions.